Okay. Let me say that literally I think it's true that there's no other person on earth that I'd more like to have a conversation with right now uh, than you. Um, let me give everybody a little bit of a rundown into uh, our, our guest today. Um, Dr. Sue Desmond Helmond is an innovative leader, former CEO of the Gates Foundation, and, had, and has had an incredible career as an oncologist, scientist, business executive, and someone who's dedicated her life to improving the human condition through innovation. She's been the, pre the president of product development at Genentech, and she's the third CEO of the Gates Foundation, as I mentioned, and the first female chancellor of the University of California, San Francisco, and now serves on the board of directors at Pfizer. And I think on behalf of all of humanity, I want to congratulate you and thank you on the announcement today that the vaccine has been approved for children. So I have two 11 year olds. Great job. Okay, so let's get started with you know, the big you know, epidemic. I just wanna get, ask you, just give us your perspective on COVID, how it went, how we handled it, what did we learn, what did we mess up, and just give us your perspective because I think you've had this incredible you know, seat at the table, literally, uh, in combating this. So, so the, we did some things well, and some things poorly. The, the, I'd start by saying this was not a surprise. This was not a surprise. The, the same world that uh, had seen SARS, mm -hmm. Ebola, Zika, um, knew that our greatest threat was something global that was spread through the respiratory route. Spread through the respiratory route. If you could add one ingredient that would make that more difficult, it would be that you can spread it while being asymptomatic. That's, you know, that's the killer, and I think we often forget that the, uh, the asymptomatic spread was especially difficult. So having come as, as something we expected, what I'll get into some of what we should have done better because okay. it's a long list and I'll try and make it short. What I think we did well, and I actually think is under-celebrated, here's the thing that I think is really quite remarkable. So Wuhan, China, which I think everyone now, if there's anyone in this room who, who doesn't now know that there is a Wuhan, China, right. <laughs> raise your hand. Um, the Wuhan, China identified the first cases and it, there's a lot of debate about this, the pace of them letting WHO and others know about it. What did go well was scientists in China did make the sequence of the virus available to others. Right. That was incredibly, incredibly important. And so I would say I give a high grade to technology. Um, it, in fact, a grade that's beyond my wildest expectations. The, the f indoor land speed record for vaccine development was months, mm -hmm. four years. Four years. Four years. In January of 2020, companies like Moderna, companies like Pfizer got the sequence to, and made a vaccine. And so having that vaccine available in less than a year, I mean, takes my breath away. Absolutely. And not only less than a year, there are two factors that I think people should be aware of. One is with messenger RNA that's never been done before, and the other is without taking any shortcuts. So lots and lots of patients, full safety database, interactions with the regulators, no um, cheating you know, right, in, in right. the vernacular. And the, the thing that was so exciting to me is if you're a product developer, if you make drugs or vaccines, your dream is that you can take science and trick bodies into doing what you want them to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, who wouldn't want to do that? If you had cancer, I'd want to trick your body into getting rid of that cancer, right? We can actually do that with some of the new cancer therapies. What messenger RNA does in our bodies normally is it tells cells to make proteins. It's kind of a neat thing. It's, it's a great tool that our bodies have. No one thought that you could, as effectively as Moderna and Pfizer have, take that same message. The message tells your cell 
to make some of the spikes on that little crown. Right. And then your body makes an antibody to it and T cells and B cells, immune cells to it. So not only was this fast, it was with never done before way cool science. Phenomenal. Phenomenal, phenomenal. So the technology here, now I don't want to leave out the J&J &J vaccine because it's also been approved in the US and other places in the world. AstraZeneca is in this category. They're what's called an adenovirus. Um, so they use a virus to uh, shuttle in mm -hmm. the payload for, for the vaccine. Those have been also very good vaccines, not quite as powerful as the messenger RNA. I would say not quite as innovative, but very innovative and done, again, like faster, speed, right. really much faster. And, and also, um, not the AstraZeneca vaccine, but J&J &J done extremely well. AstraZeneca had some strange um, uh, university type things done at Oxford that I wouldn't have done. <laughs> How about putting it that way? But really good, really well done. Here's what wasn't done well. Testing. Oh, okay. Testing. You cannot handle or control a pandemic without data. I mean, you, you're all data junkies. That's a, this is a room full of data people. Think that you have the first test that comes from the CDC and it doesn't work. That was a disaster. Yeah. That was a disaster. And so we are still today catching up with the, the need for tests, the need for uh, widely available tests, and the need for cheap tests. The other thing that's been great is monoclonal antibodies. People famously know that the former president got one of those monoclonal antibodies from Regeneron. The antibodies work great, but they have to be given just when you start having symptoms. They're very expensive, and they require a safe infusion center. So it's a little tricky. Um, but the, the final thing we didn't do well um, is we didn't win the hearts and minds of a lot of Americans with masking, with vaccination. And so the, it has taken me, and I think many people like me by surprise, how much people have avoided um, getting a free vaccine that would help save their lives and the lives of people around them. Yeah, there's a communication challenge, obviously, that I wanted to get to. But first, let me ask you, pivot this a little bit. I want to talk about innovation, okay? So I think that we all talk about innovation, product development, making new mm -hmm. things. I think that you have this sort of opportunity to work on things, innovative things, that just have this incredibly high stakes, right? High stakes yeah. product innovation is, is sort of a category I would ascribe to you in the work that you do. Uh, I, you know, talk to me about that. Talk to me about the pressure, the opportunities. You know, how do you manage that at a big organization? So the, I will tell you, it was a Sunday that um, uh, it, the CEO of Pfizer, uh, Albert Borla, arranged for a phone call with the board members. And he said, we're going to have the information from the, the uh, big vaccine trial and let you know what happens with the COVID-19 vaccine trial. And um, I always, like, like uh, optimistic human beings, and I'm very optimistic, I remember the positive product development yeah. uh, um, announcements. And so I was excited to look forward to it. Um, I didn't even think, because this is, you wouldn't stay as a product developer if you, developer if you didn't think this way. I thought, well, how will it feel? How positive will it be? Because mm -hmm. I believed in this vaccine based on the early studies. But what uh, uh, Albert Borla told the board was that it was 95, the Pfizer vaccine was 95% effective in preventing symptomatic COVID. And it was, it was just so much better than what I thought. <laughs> um, it was so much better, um, kind of take your breath away sort of thing that it really, you remember uh, Food and Drug Administration had put the barrier as it had to be more than 50%. Oh, until we get to 95. Yeah, so it left way threshold. over what was acceptable. So the, the um, I, I, it was just, I thought that Sunday, what I always think when I get to be part of um, uh, uh, revealing product development news for high stakes, high risk projects, I, I'm of two minds. One is, think of all the humans on earth. 
mm -hmm. who will benefit from mm -hmm. this. It's mm -hmm. so much fun to know that your hard work and the work of your colleagues will translate into something great for others. And the second thing is this is really fun to be part of this. You get to know a secret for a little while. <laughs> you know, that's, It's going to be fun to hear people's reaction to that. I mean, it, it brought me back to what I was um, so privileged to experience at Genentech. I knew when I was at Genentech that women with breast cancer would have something new for their breast cancer. It, and everything changes when people go into the doctor and the doctor doesn't say, you have a really scary kind of breast cancer. He or she says, you have a really scary kind of breast cancer and we have something we for have that. A treatment. We have something precisely for your kind of breast cancer. And we didn't have it last week. Yeah. And, and so for me, the negatives where I always feel like, oh, people are waiting. You know, it, 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 it's a lousy feeling for everyone when things don't work. But, but you cover off all the failures, which are inevitable in science, with the victories. Um, and, and these vaccines haven't just had a victory that Sunday that I described when we first learned 95%. They had an emergency use from FDA. They had full approval from FDA. They had approval for teenagers, approval for boosters, and now approval for five to 11 year olds, as you mentioned. And you had to scale up the manufacturing process, which we were talking about backstage. Yeah. Now, you also have experience, op, you know, responsibility for the, the, for the manufacturing of these drugs. Talk to me about that because, you know, just in the, my brief study of this, I don't know if it's as complicated as developing it in the first place, but it's a very significant amount of work, a lot of risk there too. The, uh, manufacturing, um, and there's actually been some publicity around a plant that the U.S. government had invested in that, that has struggled with manufacturing. Manufacturing is incredibly challenging for vaccines and, and biologic products. The, the simple way to think about it is, if you use chemistry to make small molecules, you may use chemistry to make Tylenol. Um, you use chemistry to make pills and, and some injectables. Chemistry is challenging, um, but way less challenging than taking a living cell or something our bodies make like mRNA and making it in large scale sterile. Remember, it's sterile, it's gonna be injected. And then for these uh, messenger RNA vaccines, Pfizer specifically, ultra cold temperatures. Pfizer had to manufacture boxes so that they could ship the vaccine in these special boxes to temperature control them. So manufacturing scale up, enormously challenging. In fact, one of the reasons, and people I'm sure have been reading about a too low supply of vaccine for poor countries. Mm -hmm. It's really sad that um, uh, there's not enough vaccine all over the world, and the entire world has to double down our efforts to get vaccines everywhere. Part of the reason is that a, a, um, a Gates Foundation-funded effort called COVAX, it's Gates Foundation and many others are funding uh, an effort to get vaccines to low-income countries, they were relying heavily on Serum Institute in India, a couple things happened at Serum Institute. One is they had some technical challenges. They're a great uh, vaccine manufacturer. They make most of the vaccines for the, the low resource uh, countries. But the second problem that happened is a big outbreak of COVID in India. And as one might, I mean, I think if, if I was the prime minister, I'd probably think like this too, honestly. He took the vaccine for India. Focused it on India, yeah. He focused on India and so not only during COVID, but I predict in the future, we will see that people will want to be um, uh, accountable for their own vaccine. Yeah, more nationalized supply chains. Absolutely, absolutely. And we, we saw that post Ebola, yeah. that when people panic, they want their own. Right. Well, so you mentioned mRNA, and, and you also have personal experience with sort of targeted treatments for cancer. I'm wondering if you give us your perspective on, have we discovered something here that'll have more, that'll be more broadly applicable in our future? And we'll point back to COVID in this moment as saying that unlocked this potential for MR, mRNA and how it'll treat other disease. It, it is, um, it, mRNA is a powerful tool. When you get scientists talking about it, they get giddy with what's possible. <laughs> and uh, they, um, it starts with infectious diseases. Okay. So some of the big infectious diseases that you'll see with mRNA are flu. 
So every year we have a new flu vaccine because the, the uh, flu virus changes a lot. Um, making new vaccines faster is possible with mRNA. So um, mRNA vaccines, uh, it would surprise me if we didn't uh, see that with flu. You'll see uh, RSV, which is a pathogen that particularly affects premature babies, uh, and CMV that affects transplant patients. So I think there's a lot of viruses that we will see. I would love those viruses to include HIV, but many of the issues with making an HIV vaccine aren't solved by M messenger RNA, so I'm, I'm nervous about that, but that will certainly be in the toolkit. Um, and then for cancer, if you can give a message to the body, let's say there's a signal in my body that's making a cancer grow, what if the messenger RNA could signal stop doing that, turn that off, or turn something on that could be helpful? A anytime you can make a message, I, there's a lot of messages I'd like to get. There's a lot of positive <laughs> messages we can read, and I'm hopeful. That, that's right, that's hopefully right. Hopefully this leads somewhere. So, it, you know, it's, it's not that simple because one of the sneaky things cancer does is if we turn up one dial, cancer turns it down or works around it. Um, that's what's happened with a lot of other cancer treatments. But what you want in cancer, and increasingly is how cancer patients experience their cancer, especially cancers like breast cancer, or prostate cancer, is you try um, best thing A, and then if your cancer is resistant to that, go to B and C. So messenger RNA gives us something else, another tool, another trick up our sleeve. So I'm enormously excited about what's possible with messenger RNA, and I'm grateful to people who spent you know, two, three decades beavering away getting their grants rejected and getting no's. <laughs> there were a lot of no's with messenger RNA. Well, yeah, you said this to me previously, that A, we expected this, and B, messenger RNA wasn't exactly just invented. This approach wasn't yeah. just invented now. And so those people that were sort of toiling behind the scenes yep. for this potential, it really all just plugged in right when it needed to. It's kind of amazing. It, it was uh, all of our collective good fortune, and I'll include me as a vaccinated person, our collective good fortune that it was ready right when we needed it. Five years ago, I don't think we'd have been here. Yeah. So you talked a second ago, and I want to go back to it, about the communication and the, the, the trust, I guess, people have. And it's been on my mind, certainly, is how to instantiate trust in an organization or whether or not we should just operate based on the assumption of no trust. You know, I think you have a perspective on this, and, and I'd love to hear your thoughts about what we learned in this and, and how institutions should work to instantiate trust with people. Yeah, well, I come at this as a physician. Okay. You know, I, I first and foremost, in fact, you might not know this about me, but they, we're in Las Vegas. Um, uh, I went to University of Nevada Medical School. I delivered 40 babies in this town. <laughs> you should find those babies. Are there any 40-year-olds in the audience that might be? <laughs> so I, I, and I really do think of trust like I think about taking the Hippocratic Oath and serving as a physician. And I think about what a, an enormous um, privilege it is to be a physician, but what a challenge it is to t take someone, especially like let's say you're in the emergency room, some stranger is gonna take care of you. Right. Yeah, some stranger is gonna take care of you and tell you what to do. I feel like in COVID-19, it felt to too many Americans and too many people all across the world like some stranger, some smarty pants strangers are gonna tell me what to do, put a mask on, isolate, take my kid out of school, take a vaccine. It, for me, the essence of trust is people can depend on you. They depend on you whether or not they need something from you, and they depend on you to understand what their life is like. And as a physician, I always thought that that was the essence of the difference between physicians I wanted to hang around with and the physician I wanted to be and the ones I didn't yeah. or I wouldn't go to. Um, so if I tell you, look, I'm going to give you and your kids this vaccine, um, trust me. That trust depends on, well, if, you're, if I'm your family doctor, that helps. 
If I'm in uh, the pharmacist in your local CVS or Walgreens or someplace else, that helps. Um, but if I'm part of the government, if I'm part of, I'll use a pejorative term, the deep state, uh, the bureaucrats, um, the nanny state, the people who tell me what to do and take away my freedom, that feels differently. Um, I, as a scientist and a physician, I find it super hard and frustrating to understand when people are against being vaccinated. Um, and I do think it goes back, as you said, to trust. Why would someone not want to protect themselves and their family and their neighbors and their colleagues if they don't trust what yeah. they've been told or that they need to, or it feels like an assault or something that's- Feels like a directive. Yeah, like, the, the, um, like when kids tell you, you're not the boss of me, right? right? Um, so I've been working a lot as a public health person to both understand what's going on and to encourage myself and my colleagues, rather than feel frustrated, feel both empathy for what that feels like when someone's bossing you around, and what, what do we do so we're more ready and more trusted next time? Yeah. You said uh, recently, maybe, something that really resonated with me, which is that we have to become comfortable saying, I don't know. Yeah. Right? As opposed to feeling like you're the leader and feeling like you're supposed to have the answers and you, people want confidence, but if you really don't know, it's hard to fake that. Right? And, and I think in this circumstance, there were so many situations where we looked at people and we sort of knew that they didn't know the answer, right. the future, the path we were going to follow, but felt this need to tell, pretend like they did. Yeah. You know? And I think that probably you deal with life and death situations and percentages and not absolute situations. I'd love your perspective because I think everybody out in the audience is leading teams and dealing with that's this question at some level. And I think you probably have an interesting perspective about that idea. So the, the, the headline I would say is, is dealing with uncertainty. Yeah. Um, how you deal with uncertainty and being comfortable with uncertainty. Um, the, and, and, you know, we just talked about trust. Part of trust is if, if I say to you, okay, here's, here's what I know about the pandemic right now. Mm -hmm. I know we just um, had this very unfortunate uh, Delta variant that was more transmissible and was a setback during August, September. I, I know that. Here's what I don't know. I don't know what December and January are going to be like. You know, I just don't know that. Um, and so I think that the saying I don't know rather than, well, here's my prediction, you know, right. because we had a lot of predictors right. in the last two years. A lot of forecasts. Yeah, and, and a lot of... Um, I don't know, almost, almost like uh, theater. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you a, a, a sense of what I consider theater. Um, theater is that we have a respiratory-borne uh, um, virus that is, it, that, and, and masks help. They definitely help. Um, washing your hands helps. Uh, not being uh, in a stuffy place that has no ventilation helps. Really bad, we knew early on, loud yelling, singing, um, these kinds of things. Here's what probably makes almost no difference, wiping things off with alcohol or sanitizer. I don't know about you, but I didn't go anywhere in the first half of 2020 that wasn't well wiped. Right. <laughs> it was wiped everywhere. Yeah, we all, everybody had crews assigned to make sure that everything right. was wiped. Right, right. So, so, you know, as, as someone's coughing on you, they're wiping, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, so I, I say that that's theater because instead of saying we, we don't know, or we, here's what we do know, we know that uh, coronaviruses are, are transmitted through the respiratory route. Mm -hmm. Now, if there's a puddle there, I'm going to worry about you, you know, but in the absence of that, wiping is probably not a big tactic. Um, and there was a lot of confusion about masks. Here's what, what the truth was, is that we didn't have enough masks. And we didn't have enough masks for caregivers, so we were giving them to caregivers. That doesn't mean you shouldn't wear a mask and I shouldn't wear a mask. So, so I think there was a lack of, of trust and credibility because people didn't say, I don't know. And it isn't just pandemics. I mean, no. as the CEO, 
it, a lot of credibility go, uh, accrues to, I'm sure, anybody in this audience who says, I don't know, what do you think? I 100% <laughs> agree with you. I don't think it just applies to CEOs. I think it applies to anybody who's trying to motivate and lead a team. Absolutely. Having the confidence to be able to say, here's what I know and here's what I don't know and here's what we can do together and figure it out as opposed to the opposite, which kind of introduces maybe a lack of trust. It, 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 a lack of trust and, and I also think the, the, it, it is so much fun when you work someplace and someone's counting on you. Mm -hmm. You know, you talked about the anxiety of being a product developer and knowing that you have this drug. I felt like the, that one way to heal the anxiety was optimism, and I've always had that in large uh, amounts. The other thing is working in teams. If you, know, if you know you have a vaccine that the world needs, and you have a great team in manufacturing, and you have a great team who's going to think about how it's distributed, and you have a wonderful clinical trials team who is going to find the areas of the world with high levels of COVID so you can go rapidly, it is so much fun to work with that. So you don't have to be like laying awake at night. I wonder if we'll get enough patients in that trial. <laughs> you know? I don't know where those patients are, but I know someone who does. I'm happy you said the word fun. That's on my mind. These, you know, working in stressful circumstances, motivating people when it's fun, that, that just makes it so much easier. So I love that you said that. Um, yep. You know, last question, I suppose, for you is, um, you know, you've had an opportunity to work on super complicated things in your career, you know, with big stakes and large teams. What advice do you have, you know, in terms of leading and motivating people around those sorts of, those sorts of projects? So the, the um, I mentioned one thing, fun. Um, for me, the being part of large enterprises, whether it's Genentech or UCSF or Gates Foundation or Pfizer, it, it, there's a sense of purpose and mission okay. that m have always motivated me. Just the, the human condition, decreasing suffering, improving people's quality of life is a huge motivator. Working with really smart, talented people is fun. That, that I think, is a lot of fun. But in the end, there's one thing that matters the most, and that is um, the values that the company sets. And that's where I do think leadership really matters, is not just values, but, but every day when you come to work, you experience those values in real time. So that um, at Genentech, we always talked about doing things so that were good for patients. Mm -hmm. um, and that we thought about the patient and, and every single day when we came to work. So many hard things happened to a company that was so early in its life trying such hard things. And, and literally, I would think, okay, patients are waiting. What's good for them? And the more that you would experience other people doing that, it just felt good to work for a place that did that visibly. And so I think the, the fun, the purpose, the talent, um, the mission are all awesome. And the values matter the most in the end. And I think I really, if I can, if I can, you can tell me if I'm picking up on this correctly. The idea that all of that can be summarized in that little mantra of the patients waiting and what, and what would they want, that really, really helps, I think. We used to we used to say that I, I mean I, I like mottos I actually <laughs> remember them at, at Genentech the motto right before I left was in business for life wow and that just just it just you know I have a button <laughs> <laughs> and the at the Gates Foundation that all lives have equal value and that's you know if I think about COVID uh, vaccines and what the world needs all lives have equal value that's a good mantra that's a great mantra. Well, can I just please say on behalf of everyone, thank you. Thank you for your personal contribution and for the organizations that you represent. Um, I'm speechless almost to just how, in, how grateful I am for the, for the work that, that went on this year or these past two years and the position that we're in now. So I, I deeply, deeply appreciate it. And so thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thank you.